Hello and welcome to the UH CTAR Livestock Industry Virtual Field Day Program. I am Mark Thorne, the Range and Livestock Extension Specialist for the University of Hawaii Manoa Cooperative Extension. And I want to thank you for tuning in to this presentation for on grazing management for tropical grass finished beef production. In this presentation, I'm going to briefly describe the history of ranching and cattle production in Hawaii, focusing on the industry's evolution and resiliency through the years. I will then briefly describe the current status of the industry, focusing on challenges and emerging market opportunities. And I will then turn our attention to specific information, practices, and strategies needed to efficiently finish cattle on grass in tropical environments. The first cattle and sheep were brought into the islands in 1793 as a gift to King Kamehameha I by Captain Vancouver. A kapu was placed on the livestock to prevent the harvest and, and allowing the numbers to increase. The kapu lasted until 1810 when the livestock numbers reached sustainable levels and being unmanaged were becoming a nuisance. Ranching in Hawaii started in an effort to bring the wild livestock under management. By the mid-1830s, ranching was firmly established as an agricultural enterprise in Hawaii. Local slaughter and salted beef products were the main market outlets for Hawaii beef cattle until the 1950s when the feedlot industry began. Hawaii feedlot operations were established in the 1950s and 1960s, and this allowed for the expansion of beef cattle production in the state. Cattle production in Hawaii peaked in the 1970s at 240,000 head of cattle. The feedlot finishing of cattle in Hawaii was based primarily on concentrate feeds imported in from the mainland. The steady rise of energy costs from 1970 to the 1990s eventually put the feedlot operations out of business as the cost of shipping concentrate feeds into Hawaii became too expensive. Hawaii ranchers shifted in response by shipping wean-off calves to the mainland, the only market available for them at the time. With the loss of the feedlots and a shift in cattle markets, came the contraction of the local slaughter capacity. The key point I want to stress with this review of the Hawaii ranching and beef cattle production industry is the resilience of this industry through time. Throughout its long history in Hawaii, the beef industry has made the changes necessary to adapt to shifting market conditions and opportunities. Currently, there are about 140,000 head of cattle, including all cows and calves in Hawaii. This is slightly lower than where we were in 2019, which was the culmination of a period of herd expansion following several years of drought starting in 2008 through 2013. Although local slaughter of beef cattle is increasing, slaughter capacity remains a significant bottleneck. Still, increased costs and other challenges of shipping live cattle, along with the volatility of live cattle prices on the mainland, is generating increased interest in grass-finished beef production in Hawaii. Live cattle prices have always gone through cycles fluctuating between low and high values. Cattle prices today are about $107 per hundredweight. This is better than where we were earlier in the year, but not as good generally as in the period from 2015 up to the latter part of 2019. Today's cattle prices are about as good as they were in 2011 when we saw the beginnings of a record increase in live cattle prices leading up to a peak in 2015. Meanwhile, farm expenses between 2011 and now, according to the National Statistics Service, have increased by 15%. So here are a few questions and facts for us to ponder. And I don't have the answers to these questions, but I do think it is healthy for us to consider them because the potential conditions they reflect could easily become a reality for the Hawaii beef industry. How long will mainland beef cattle prices continue to make it profitable to ship wean off cattle to the mainland? Beef prices fluctuate over time, but as we saw, have not increased significantly over the past 25 years. On the other hand, shipping and the cost of production continually increase. What would happen to the Hawaii beef industry if mainland prices no longer cover the cost of shipping, or if shipping were to suddenly stop? Slaughter capacity and pasture acreage would need to increase 
to accommodate the resulting shift in market needs of the industry. On the other hand, commodity beef imports will always be cheap, abundant, and in demand. In these challenges lie opportunities for the Hawaii beef cattle industry to develop and market more grass-finished beef locally. Further, the timing for this is right. There is a growing consumer movement to buy local food and other products, and their purchasing decisions are changing. They are demanding more local, natural, organic products. Grass-finished beef is higher in omega-3 and CLAs and considered to be healthier, a healthier choice than feedlot beef. This makes grass-finished beef a premium product. And if you produce a premium product, you can demand a premium price. Finishing beef cattle on grass is challenging because it is affected by so many variables. In a manner, finishing beef on grass is part art and part science. Scientifically, we know that grass finished beef production and quality is a function of beef animal genetics, forage quantity and quality over the beef production cycle, the age of the animal at slaughter, and the climatic conditions that affect forage production and animal performance. The art is understanding how these factors interact and manage them in such a way to consistently finish beef animals that result in a quality meat product. The art is practiced through our grazing management decisions and practices. So grazing management decisions for grass finished beef production are really about manipulating animal genetics and forage quantity and quality within the context of the ranch environment. They are the key to consistently finishing cattle on grass to produce a quality carcass. Now, in order for us to understand how those grazing management decisions influence carcass quality, we first need to understand what carcass quality measures are most important and how they are a product of animal genetics and forage environment. The big three carcass quality traits are marbling, ribeye area, and tenderness. Marbling is a measure of the intramuscular fat content of the meat. It affects the flavor and juiciness of the meat. The deposition of intramuscular fat is a function of a high energy to protein diet provided late in the finishing phase. Marbling ability is a highly heritable trait. Ribeye area is related to carcass size. The standard ribeye measure of 12 to 15 square inches yields an 8 to 12 ounce steak, one inch thick. Ribeye area is more or less a function of genetics. Larger frame animals have a larger ribeye than smaller frame cattle. Tenderness is a measure of the force needed to tear the meat fibers. Consumers identify more with tenderness than any other carcass quality trait. It is a function of the animal's age at slaughter. Tenderness is also highly heritable and correlated with the high butterfat content in the milk. We are going to focus on each of these three traits in the next several slides. Achieving a high marbling percentage in grain finished beef is much easier than for grass finished beef. As I mentioned, marbling is a result of a diet high in energy later in the animal's production cycle. In fact, intramuscular fat deposits only after the animal has reached 65 to 70 percent of its mature body weight. So for example, 65 to 70 percent of an animal whose mature body weight will be 1,200 pounds is 780 to 840 pounds. In terms of age, this is between 12 and 16 months. High concentrate feeds like corn and other grains are higher in energy than forage and so it is easier to deposit intramuscular fat on grain than on forage. Most grass forages have half or less energy than fed grains and as a result grass finished beef will always be leaner than grain fed beef when genetic potential is equal across animals. We can however make management decisions to maximize the animal's potential on grass through our management decisions. For example the energy content of forages is highest in the early maturing to boot stage of the forage production cycle. Managing pasture rotations to maximize the availability of early maturing forages when the animals reach their 65 to 70 percent mature body weight will help increase marbling. 
At the very least, grass-finished animals should be on a high rate of gain on high-energy forage going into slaughter to assure a quality marbled tender product. Ribeye area has become an important indicator of carcass quality. It is related to carcass size and therefore primarily a function of genetics. Larger frame animals will have a larger ribeye area than smaller frame animals. However, the size difference comes at a cost. Larger frame size cattle, those exceeding a frame score of five, have a higher maintenance energy requirement. If you're finishing cattle on grain, this cost can easily be overcome. But on grass, the same animal will take much more time to finish than a smaller frame animal. The grain fed industry has basically set the standard and consumer expectations for the size of their ribeye steaks. This standard calls for steaks to fall within a 12 to 15 square inch range, yielding an eight to 12 ounce steak, one inch thick. As we will see, tenderness is related to the age of the animal at slaughter. Beyond 24 months, tenderness decreases rapidly, no matter the breed. To finish an animal on grass requires a frame size that can reach maturity within a suitable age range. This is hard to do with animals larger than a five frame consuming low energy grass forages. The recommendation is for a moderate frame cattle that are early maturing. At the Mailani Experiment Station, our moderate frame cattle average an 11.6 square inch ribeye when finished at about 1,200 pounds between 22 and 24 months. What we sacrifice in ribeye area, we gain in tenderness. I am going to spend a couple of slides on tenderness as it is the meat quality trait most consumers identify with. Much of what I will present here comes from several UH CTAR research projects looking at beef quality, tenderness, and consumer preferences in Hawaii. Meat tenderness is a highly heritable trait and is probably correlated with high butter fat content in the milk. Genetics being equal though, UH CTAR researcher, researchers have shown that tenderness is a function of the age of the animal at slaughter. Tenderness is impacted by several factors that are all within the control of the rancher. Periods of no gain or weight loss in the production cycle of the animal, no matter when it occurs, will result in a loss of tenderness. Also, periods of fasting or the lack of water immediately prior to slaughter will decrease tenderness as this tends to increase glycogen and pH in the meat. Finally, too rapid of cooling post-slaughter will decrease tenderness of the meat. It is important to note that lean carcasses are more prone to rapid cooling than fatty carcasses due to cold shortening of the muscles. The data presented in this slide comes from a UH CTAR research project conducted by Kim et al. and published in 2007. They collected 191 ribeye steaks of grass-finished beef harvested at two slaughter facilities in Hawaii for analysis of tenderness based on the Warner Bratzler shear force methods. Based on research by Miller et al. in 2001, showing that 86% of consumer were satisfied with the steak's tenderness when its shear force values were below 4.3 kilograms, Kim et al. found that only 35% of Hawaii grass finished beef samples met this criterion. The average shear force value for these steaks was 5.2 kilograms. To understand why Hawaii grass finished beef had such a high shear force value, they looked at several other variables. Comparing tenderness measured by shear force, Kim et al. found that shear force increased with age and beyond 24 months, the shear force values of Hawaii beef cattle exceeded acceptable ranges for consumer satisfaction. So in this slide, the lower black hash line is at 4.3 kilograms, the point at which consumer satisfaction was at 86%. The upper red line is at 5.21 kilograms, which was the average shear force value for Hawaii grass finished beef. The green line is the age tenderness trend line for Hawaii grass finished beef. Shear force on the vertical axis and age along the horizontal axis. Shear force increased linearly from 4.49 at 12 months of age to 5.2 at 
at 36 months. A shear force value of 5 has a very low consumer acceptance rate. What these data show is that to achieve a tenderness that will be acceptable to most consumers, grass-finished beef in Hawaii will need to be harvested at 24 months or younger. So how do we do this consistently? Of course, there are no easy solutions, and transitioning to grass-finished beef production by a ranch in Hawaii will require selecting and breeding for the appropriate genetic traits. Keeping in mind that frame size is a significant determinant on the energy demand of the animal and that larger frame animals will grow more slowly on grass than small and medium frame animals. As this chart shows, maintenance energy needs increase linearly with body size. To reach a suitable finish weight within 24 months, animals will need to be early maturing, easy fleshing cattle of a moderate frame score, somewhere between 3 and 5. This chart provides a reference for the different frame scores in hip height measurements and expected slaughter weight ranging from a frame score of 3 to 8. A steer with a frame score of 5 will measure 49 inches at 12 months, 55.9 inches at maturity, and from birth to slaughter this animal will need to average 1.64 pounds per day of gain to reach his expected slaughter weight of 1,200 pounds with a half inch of fat cover. By contrast, a steer of, with a six frame will need to average 1.78 pounds per day of gain to reach his expected slaughter weight of 1,300 pounds with a half inch of fat over that same period. An average daily rate of gain at 1.78 pounds per day is likely the maximum rate of gain that can be expected for cattle on grass in Hawaii. These animals would need to be raised on the very best forage lands with a precision grazing management program. Matching the genetics of animals to the forage environment is essential, and as we noted, it must provide an abundance of high quality forage during the entire production cycle of the animal from birth to slaughter. This map was generated by UHC TAR researchers based on rainfall and forage production data collected across 15 sites in the islands representing different forage production environments. These were used to determine lands with a high suitability for finishing cattle on forage. I'm going to focus in on Hawaii County to illustrate a couple of points. First, the most suitable zones of grass finished beef production occur in areas where the rainfall is most consistent and generally where it exceeds at least 30 inches annually. These include the windward areas <clears throat> and mid-elevation zones such as the wet side of the Waimea Plain and the upper Kohala Mountains. Conversely, low elevation zones below 50 inches of rainfall are too hot and seasonally dry to support grass-finished beef production. Likewise, high elevation zones above 4,500 feet are generally too seasonally dry to support year-round grass-finished beef production. However, they may fit within a larger rotational system where they are grazed during their peak forage production periods and rested during the dry season. Grass finished suitability publications for Hawaii, Maui, and Kauai counties have been published and are available on the CTAR publications website, or you can contact myself or the county, your county livestock agent for copies if you're interested. Dr. Anibal Portomingo an expert in grass-finished beef production from Argentina, had suggested the following par parameters to successfully produce consistent beef on grass. First, the average daily gain needs to exceed 1.7 pounds per day and be at 1.8 pounds per day in the last 90 days. Second, the, animal need, the animals need to finish at around 22 months and not over 30 months. Weeding at an older age is a useful tool to reduce the time on grass from wean to slaughter. The following model comparison was run between Puerto Mingo's model parameters, a feedlot model, and the UH CTAR Mailani grass finished beef production numbers. This comparison study revealed not only how Mailani's production numbers lined up, but showed what is possible in Hawaii 
in our best forage environments and revealed areas needed for research and improvement. The models all start with an average birth weight for the cattle of 80 pounds and an average daily gain while on the mother of 2.1 pounds per day. For the feedlot production curve, we used wean, a weaning date of six months at 450 pounds. So the stalker phase is from six to 18 months at 390 days, gaining 375 pounds at a rate of 0.96 pounds per day. And the feedlot phase is from months 19 to 22 or 122 days, gaining another 375 pounds at a rate of 3.12 pounds per day. The birth to slaughter average daily gain is 2.06 pounds per day. For the grass finish production curve, that is Puerto Mingo's model, the weaning date is eight months at about 630 pounds. Months nine to 22 or 420 days, the animals gain 570 pounds at an average daily gain rate of 1.36 pounds per day. The birth to slaughter average daily gain is 1.73 pounds per day. We ran these models against the Mayalani production numbers. At Mayalani, we wean at six months of age or 180 days at 450 pounds for a 2.1 pounds per day average daily gain. The animals are on grass from months 6 to 22 or 510 days, gaining 750 pounds for an average daily gain of about 1.47 pounds per day. So the birth to slaughter average daily gain is 1.78 pounds per day. The chart on this slide shows the production curve of the feedlot model in blue, Mayalani in green, and Porto Mingo's grass finish model in yellow. Importantly, the Mayalani production curve tracks well with Porto Mingo's suggested grass finish parameters and shows that quality grass finished beef can be produced in Hawaii. In the next few slides, I'm going to highlight a study we conducted to test Porto Mingo's suggestion that weaning at an older age would be beneficial for grass finishing. In this study, we ran, randomly selected an equal number of steers and heifers into three groups weaned at 400, 500, and 600 pounds each year for three years. The cattle in each group were raised on grass at the station until they reached slaughter weight. The charts on this slide show weight on the vertical axis and life stage uh, weight at birth, weaning, and slaughter for each group, separated by steers on top and heifers on the bottom. As you can see in the steers, there was a definite advantage of weaning at 600 pounds that showed up in the slaughter weight. There was no advantage of the 500 and 400 pound groups. On the other hand, regardless of the weaning weight, the heifers all ended up slaughtering at the same weight. This difference could be due to the selection of heifers for early maturity a desirable trait for replacement breeding stock. When we compared the carcass quality traits between the weaning weight groups and between steers and heifers, we found only slight numerical differences in marbling numeric and dressing percentages across all groups. Ribeye area varied across groups but did not show consistent trends with values between 11.1 .1 and 11.9 .9 square inches across the steers and heifers. Carcass weights were greater for the steers than the heifers. Within group variation in, in carcass weight was much higher for the steers than the heifers. Again, likely a function of the higher selective pressure we put on heifers as replacement breeding stock to be early maturing. To summarize these data, it appears that holding steers to a 600 pounds before weaning does provide some advantage over lighter weaning weights. This was not true for the Mayalani heifers. So we've talked a lot about the meat quality traits, matching the animal to the environment, proper genetics, and we've looked at different production models to understand what parameters are necessary to consistently finish beef on grass. However, without proper grazing management strategies in place, the animals, despite the best genetics and forage environment, 
will not perform at their full potential. With the proper genetics in place for your forage environment, grazing management decisions boil down to the allocation of forage, and there are two important contrasting factors that must be considered. The first is the estimate of unrestricted daily intake. This is typically calculated as a proportion of live body weight on a dry matter basis. Common values range from 2.6 to 3.3% for most cattle. A good average for grass finished beef is to assume that they will need at least 3% of their body weight in dry matter daily. This is your daily per animal forage demand and it is important that it is unrestricted. As you recall, any restrictions in diet or weight loss can affect their finished weight and tenderness. The second factor in considering forage allocation is harvesting efficiency. This is the amount of forage consumed by the animals in the pasture and it depends on the grazing pressure, that is the forage demand, and the residual forage you desire to leave behind. Harvest efficiencies greater than 60% of the forage mass have been shown to be detrimental to the rate of gain in cattle on grass. This is because the more intense forages are grazed, the lower the quality of the forage that's left behind. Poor quality forage will yield poor gains. On the other hand, harvest efficiencies up to 50% of the forage mass have not been shown to be detrimental to the average daily gain. This take half, leave half rule of thumb is also good for the pasture. When considering what grazing scheme to use, there are a couple of considerations. Continuous grazing is difficult to manage for proper quantity and quality of forage throughout the year due to fluctuations in precipitation from season to season and year to year. Short duration rest rotation systems are best for continuous budgeting of proper quantity and quality of forage for grass finished beef production. However, it is important to understand how stock density influences harvest efficiency and animal performance. The chart on this slide depicts livestock production on a per animal unit basis in the solid line and a per unit area basis on the dashed line as a function of grazing intensity that originates from the additive effects of grazing intensity on solar energy capture, harvest efficiency, and assimilation efficiency. Grazing intensity increases when animals are added to a unit area or the length of time a set number of animals graze a unit area. As grazing intensity increases, forage production decreases. That is, solar energy capture decreases because there is a less leaf area to intercept solar radiation. Harvest efficiency increases as an increasing number of animals per unit area consume plant material. Assimilation efficiency decreases as forage intake restrictions per individual animal limit nutrient and energy availability for growth. The end result is that production per animal decreases as grazing intensity increases while production per unit area increases. Livestock production per unit area continues to increase with grazing intensity because it is dependent on both individual animal performance and the total number of animals. Eventually, production per unit area decreases rapidly with increasing grazing intensity because increasing livestock numbers are no longer able to compensate for the limited production per individual. Therefore, the grazing intensity, which maximizes sustainable animal production per unit area, is that which optimizes the process of solar energy capture, harvest efficiency, and assimilation efficiency. In this slide, I've taken the previous chart developed by Heitschmidt and Stuth and overlaid the body condition score scale to the production per animal unit scale. The body condition score of five is centered at the peak of the production per unit area curve. Ideally, our breeding cows would live in this range between the body condition score of four and six on the high end. This will maximize their breeding efficiency and calf production while, efficiency, while efficiently utilizing the available forage 
without resulting in declining pasture conditions. Cows consistently classified in a body condition score of three or less are indicative of overgrazing of the forage resource and should be avoided. Finishing beef animals will be classified in a body condition score of seven or eight when they have a half inch fat cover over their four ribs and back. To achieve this level of condition, they have to be grazed in an environment that favors the individual animal over the whole herd. Or said another way, they cannot compete with their herd mates for forage or it will depress their genetic ability to grow on the available forage. Therefore, grass finished cattle should be stocked lighter to reduce grazing intensity than what the stocking rate would be for a cow herd. I believe grass finished beef production will become increasingly important in Hawaii. Shipping costs will continue to increase, mainland prices will remain volatile and may, at times, not return profits in line with the cost of shipping. Producing a consistent quality meat product on grass is an art and science and requires the manager understand the factors that affect animal performance, the forage environment, and proper allocation of forage resources. While marbling and ribeye area receive a lot of publicity when meat quality is discussed, consumers identify with tenderness more often. Tenderness is a function, largely, of the age of the animal at slaughter. Animals under 24 months of age tend to remain with any tenderness range most consumers find acceptable. Consequently, the ideal grass-finished beef animal in Hawaii will be moderate framed, early maturing, and easy fleshing, and able to reach a 1,200 pound mature body weight with a half inch cover of fat within 24 months of age. However, even if the genetics are in place, Proper grazing management and allocation of forage is essential as any deficiencies in forage will result in a loss of tenderness and delayed finish. So with that, I'll wrap up by saying thanks for viewing this presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I hope you enjoy the rest of this virtual field day program. Good day and thank you.